One of the things we know about great teaching is that the environment, the climate for learning is absolutely essential. And uh, one of the, the, the areas that's easy to overlook there is how you organise students for learning. And it seems to me that uh, a canny way of doing that is to think what you want them to learn and organising the room accordingly. My own experience is removing the desks doesn't lessen the teacher's control, it increases the teacher's control, interestingly enough, because what desks do is they create a barrier behind which students, and indeed sometimes teachers, can kind of hide. And actually saying, in a second, I'm going to ask you to move all the tables to the side, I want you to do it quickly and carefully, and then I want you to put your chair around in a circle here because we're going to discuss something. There's something very powerful about that. Now clearly we're all going to be confined by the actual school buildings we've got and it will be the case that uh, some schools, this is what you're going to have to do all the time. It is a disadvantage, I think, because it's limiting the teacher's flexibility. Make sure that you don't allow no-go zones to develop because there's going to be some youngsters who are kind of locked into the middle there uh, who may feel that they're, they're not going to have the teacher influence. It is going to be harder to get to a student there or a student there from here. And when I say get to, I simply mean if you want to talk to them or you also want to calm down their language and so on. And therefore, even though you've got what will seem a fairly inflexible format, I think what great teachers will do is they'll want to circulate and they'll want to show that there isn't any area where they might not come to have a conversation or to ask how students are making progress. Right, can you stick that in your book, please? There are going to be some points and some lessons where the focus is going to be at the front. It might be that the teacher is going to do some talking or we're going to be watching a documentary or something like that and actually have to, to have students clearly focused on that, sitting in pairs in what will seem a traditional format may be perfect because it might be that what you would want to do is to show them something or talk to them about something and then give them time to discuss it without lots and lots of movement. I think the weakness is that lots, lots of teachers never think about how they want to arrange the room and therefore this becomes the default mode and that therefore leads to a kind of staticness but also a sense that the shape of the room is nothing to do with the learning that's expected to happen. A format where you've got students quite clearly grouped together so that they can make eye contact with one another is the ideal format for students learning. What I tend to do is to see the classroom as a bit of an arena uh, and to make sure that there is some kind of focal point from which I can speak and everybody can both hear me and, and, uh, and uh, see me. But it's also important that the teacher clings on to a really important essential of teaching, and that is there will be times when I will need to explain things or ask questions. And in order to do that effectively, I must move you from where you are. So what I would be doing in here is saying, right, thanks everyone, turn your chairs around so you're looking this way. I need a couple of minutes to explain things, but I do need to make sure everyone's listening. So even though that's going to be messy, I'm going to acknowledge it's messy and say, OK, folks, we're going to make a bit of noise now because I need you to turn around and look this way so that we can explain what's going to happen next. OK, show me your answers. For me, the optimum size of a group is four because what we all know is that as soon as you're in a group which is beyond four, your identity with the group and your role in the group, I think, becomes more diffuse. A smaller group, four students, clearly identifying who's doing what within that, is likely to work better and that's why for me either having a table where there's quite a lot of surface area because they're writing things putting a poster together or whatever it might be or in fact not giving them much surface area but having them working closely together because it's about discussion and they can then just make some notes that would work as well but as always it comes down to what do we want them to learn how do we want them to learn it and that should then guide us in how we organize the room I think realistically, teachers aren't going to be able to uh, be m moving furniture all over the place all the time. And my guess is that many of us develop a kind of default layout. But we have to be cautious about that, because that default layout may be because of our teaching style, rather than what students are intending to learn. Students will work in a way that's appropriate, but the authority of the teacher is there all the way through, because the last thing you want is that no-go zones start to dominate and that the culture of the classroom is defined by youngsters instead of by the teacher. So I think what I would be saying is let's train students to recognise there will be times, maybe every lesson there will be times when we're going to move them around or move tables around and they will simply become good at doing it and we'll explain the rationale for doing it so that we don't get the groans from them and they'll see that there are real benefits to working in different ways for different aspects of the lesson.